And, um, and then when Americans come, you'd be cleaned up. Yes. And given different clothes. Yes. And then you were told you can't say anything and you had to act like everything was good. And the moment you leave, all that stuff disappears. Yes. Yeah, see, this is uh, what the Russians call a Potemkin village. This is very common. And this is what's happening with these children. And as Sasha points out, those children who, who, were, who were brave enough to try to say to those people, help us, these evil things are happening to us. They shut those kids away. You know, I've spent my career taking on some of the cultural baddies, you know, some of the most prominent intellectuals in the world, some of them in public debate, some of them behind the scenes. And I've come to realize that ideas define everything that we do. With an academic degree, you're trained to be a researcher and writer to the point that it's annoying. I mean, but I'm grateful for it. I'm not talking about books I've not read. I'm not talking about papers I've not read. Whether I agree with them or not actually isn't the point. Uh, there are quite a few books that I would read that I would say are actually evil books. Donald Trump, when he was in a divorce with his first wife, she said he has a copy of Mein Kampf next to his bed. I wish more people did. If the German people had bothered to read that book rather than just have it on their shelf, we might have avoided the Holocaust. If more people read the Quran, they'd be wiser to what Islam actually is, what they actually believe. If people bothered to read, as I have, the writings of Klaus Schwab and the various contributors to the World Economic Forum and the ideas that are driving the globalists, I read them because I want to understand their mentality. I cut out the middleman. I go straight to the ideology. Everything in your life is being defined by either your ideas or the ideas of the people around you. And each episode, we're gonna be digging into a different idea that appears in the culture. This is Ideas Have Consequences with me, Larry Alex Taunton. Welcome to a special episode of Ideas Have Consequences. Um, you know, this is a real thrill for me um, today. Uh, we're, we're not a we're not a real interview driven um, podcast, but it's very special for me today to have as my first guest on the podcast my daughter Sasha. How are you, Sasha? I'm doing well. <laughs> Sasha's a, a little anxious to be um, on this podcast, but I'm not just having her on simply because uh, she's my daughter. This isn't this isn't a case of some nepotism here. Rather, Sasha is a very powerful spokesperson for the gospel. She's one of the boldest um, evangelists and and apologists um, that I know. But some of you who have read this, my first book, uh, The Grace Effect, will know Sasha's story because this book is, is largely her story. And let, let me set up this interview just a little bit, Sasha, before we come around um, to telling your story. Now, I have said here that Sasha is our daughter, and uh, it's funny because in my mind, I can remember Sasha as a baby. I can remember holding her in my arms. I can remember bottle feeding her. I can remember all that, and yet that's not actually true. And it's because Sasha came to us via an orphanage in Ukraine when she was almost 11 years old, when we, when we uh, adopted her, and she was such a blessing in our lives. We, we had three boys, and I come from a family of boys, and then we had three boys, and then Sasha came, and she was like a tornado into our house. There was a lot of adjusting um, in our household to have a, uh, uh, another female other than my wife and my children's mom you know, in the household to have Sasha there. That was, uh, that was very interesting. And Sasha, you know, her, she, she didn't speak a word of English when we, we first met her. She knew, uh, you know, both Russian and um, um, some Ukrainian. And um, Sasha is now a wife and mother. Um, she's thriving. She's, she's very successful. But some of you who will know her from this book will go, oh, wow. You know, because I'm telling her story here. And the reason I was telling her story, in case you think this book is an adoption book. That's, that's not what the book is about. I, at the time um, that, the, that uh, we were in the process of adopting Sasha, at the same time, um, 
I was involved in taking on some of the very well-known um, new atheists, so-called new atheists, guys like Richard Dawkins and the late Christopher Hitchens and Sam Harris and Daniel Dennett. And one of those guys, uh, chief arguments was to say that Christianity is uh, just something we don't need. We just need to get rid of it because it doesn't have any real cultural benefits. And um, it was something that I, I always was kind of fascinated with, remain fascinated with, uh, with guys like that, uh, and now with the uh, with the woke mob, uh, all leftists, is that they have such a disdain for history. And I would want to say to them, you guys are acting like a godless society hasn't ever been tried before. It has with disastrous effects. I mean, this is what this is what um, you know the Soviet Union was. This is what Mao's uh, China was. This is what Hitler's Germany was. This is what North Korea still is. And then there are other religious expressions around the world that are not Christian that are equally totalitarian when we start talking about Islamic states. Um, the uh, Christian faith has given rise to um, science. It's given rise to our art, our literature, our laws, all these things. But I was thinking about this stuff and I thought, how do I tell this story? How do I tell this story in a way that it doesn't just come across as a... Uh, you know, just simply like you're reading an encyclopedia. And it dawned on me because we were going back and forth to Ukraine at the time in the process of adopting Sasha. And while we were doing this, it dawned on me that the orphanages where Sasha uh, was and had been um, were all running off of old Soviet, which is to say old communist, which is to say socialist, Marxist, atheistic, principles. They were completely godless. I, I, I began to, to see this and that the government was still essentially this old Soviet um, bureaucracy that was corrupt to the core. Um, those of you who have followed my writings and have followed this podcast know that I'm no fan of Ukraine. She is the reason I'm not a fan of Ukraine. We love Sasha as, uh, as our own biological child, but the things that Sasha endured, that I saw her endure, that I saw that children like her were enduring in that corrupt country made me hate that country, not the people of that country. But there wasn't a single government official that we didn't deal with that we did not have to bribe in order to finish, to complete that adoption with Sasha. It's important to have a Christian worldview. The question becomes, how do we build that? How do we develop that? Oftentimes we have Bible teachers who are very faithful in teaching scripture, but don't ever quite make the connection with the outside world. Other times we have Bible teachers who don't really wanna to touch certain topics because they're just seen to be too toxic. At tomap.com, you are gonna find a wide range of issues being addressed to help you build out that Christian worldview. They're on things from, from suffering, uh, dealing with mental health, to racial reconciliation. These are all issues that you will find at tomap.com, and they'll help you to build out a Christian worldview and to flourish. I hope you learn a lot from the podcast, but you can go beyond the podcast to the courses that we offer at Tome. So I hope you'll take a look at them and sign up. To get access to more than 100 Tome courses, use the code IDEAS. And for $8.25 a month, you can get access to all kinds of courses on a wide variety of subjects. Individuals with expertise, with experience in subjects that will be meaningful to you. So use the code IDEAS and for $8.25 a month, you can get access to all of them. Go to tomap.com. Back to the podcast. So on the very day that a Ukrainian court declared Sasha our child, the orphanage directors followed us. Do you remember this? Mm -hmm. They followed us to the bank because the Ukrainian government gives the children, this is just to make them feel better about themselves, the equivalent of roughly $200 a year that goes into a bank account 
for the children in the orphanage that they can't access until I think their 16th birthday. But they wanted that money. They were determined they were going to get that money. And so they followed us there and they said, hey, you know, can you give it to us for the children? You know, for the children. And we thought, we need to do this as Sasha's money, but we need to give them this money because we're not out of the country yet. And um, so if this is what is going to make them happy, I think it was roughly, it was a little more than $200. Uh, $200. I think it was, I think it came to, you know, $1,500, $2,000, something to that effect. And so I now, as her guardian, with you, we go to the bank, we fill out the forms, the bank teller gives us the money in cash, we turn right around around, we just hand it to them when they disappear. We don't see them again. So when I tell you that there are no good guys in this, uh, in this war in Ukraine, maybe the United States the least of all, I've spent a lot of time in Ukraine. I've spent a lot of time in Russia. I assure you they are both equally corrupt. And this is part of the story that I'm telling in The Grace Effect. But that story... I'm telling with Sasha as really the vehicle to tell the story because it dawned on me that the way to help people understand the dangers of socialism and everything that comes with it, the way to tell that is by giving them a flesh and blood example of what a life looks like that is graceless, that is in a society that hasn't really been significantly touched by the gospel and a society that has been significantly touched by the gospel, that is the United States. That is to say, uh, human nature in the United States is no different than it is in Ukraine or Russia or anywhere else. So how do we account for the differences? Well, the differences have to do with the fact that the gospel has significantly penetrated one of those countries and it hasn't the other. So I thought while Sasha was visiting with us, she's brought our lovely little granddaughter um, here to see us, that it would be great to have her on the podcast to tell a little bit of her story. Uh, so Sasha, um, you don't have to say anything in this podcast you don't want to say. So if anything that, that you deem to be too private or you just deem to be too difficult to talk about, that's okay. You don't have to talk about any of it. But when you think of the orphanages, you know, there are people that I talk to who want to say, oh, we have orphanages in the United States. They're not that bad. They're not that bad. It wouldn't be that bad to be in an orphanage in Ukraine. How do you respond to people who say things like that? Well, it makes me really, really upset and mad because United States is completely different um, where I lived. So there's much better opportunities. People are treated more better. So um, not saying that the kids in a better position not having parents, but that's rightly to say. But, but it's not, it's ours is worse. Um. Did you feel like in the orphanages that they cared about the children? Not at all. N not at all. Um, what makes you say that? Um, well, anytime if we've been abused, um, either um, sexually or abused physically, um, you um, call out for help and just the, um, the care of, of the orphanage people who took care of us, they just look at us and pass us and care about nothing. So we had to... Be responsible for ourselves to take care of of our own beings. So from, from the time you were very little. From very time I was little. Um, so um, you were Sasha Sasha's uh, biological mom um, disappeared um, from the hospital when Sasha was born. So she just immediately went into an orphanage and she went to three different orphanages and just right off the bat, you had to care about yourself. Yes. You had to protect yourself. Yes. And the third orphanage, which made it more harder is you have kids six through age through. So you're a um, um, graduate 16. So you have a bunch of kids who are mixed, who are kids who are bigger, your own size to defend yourself. I think that's way worse. So um, in this case, you were 10 at, at the time that, that um, we, first, we first encountered you. And um, I, you were in there with, with boys and girls who are 16. Yes. 
um, much bigger, um, a lot of bullying that was very common. Yes. Yes. Not, not only from the boys, but even from girls. How about in terms of the kind of food and things like that that are served in the orphanages? Um, we just had bread, uh, water and milk and not much meat. Um, we had a well-known soup called borscht, um, which is a very Ukrainian thing. Yeah. And um, one of the things that tickles me about <laughs> Sasha now, if she were to stand up here and you were to see her, she's just as, she's just as skinny as she could be. She doesn't put on any weight. But if I took Sasha to a steakhouse today, <laughs> Sasha is a carnivore. Uh, she will order a porterhouse and she will put that thing down and uh, she will absolutely demolish it and never, never, gain, never gain a pound. But um, Sasha was uh, just immediately, she craved to have real meat is is dalton giving you a lot of good steak dinners oh yeah <laughs> yeah i just remember first time when you took me in mcdonald's ukraine that was the best thing ever because i wanted mcdonald's all the time which now being in the united states that's like the not the best food you have <laughs> so for us it, for me it was the best yeah i will say this McDonald's in Ukraine is better than it is. I mean, it is, isn't it? McDonald's in yeah. Ukraine and in France is better than in Russia is better than it is in the United States because it's considered to be a good job and it's considered to be a decent restaurant. They keep them very clean. The service is very good and the burgers are just a little bigger and a little more substantive. So I actually liked eating there um, in uh, in Ukraine, uh, particularly because I don't like borscht. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't care for uh, for borscht at all. I don't care for Ukrainian food. But uh, one of the adoption facilitators was translator for me. He was telling me that in the adoption, um, excuse me, in the orphanage where Sasha was, that he went into the kitchen and he said a lot of the food that the children are being served is rotten. It's actually rotten. He said he was going through and he said, uh, you know, the stench uh, in the kitchen. And I was looking at, at, at some of the vegetables they're giving the kids. And he says it's rotten food. And you were given meat, what was it, once a week? Once a week. And, and how much was that? I don't even know. I remember you telling me it was like a little very, small. It was very little, so it was we didn't have that much. You just didn't get get much in uh, in that regard. Another funny thing I have to say about Sasha: Sasha will sit down and she will eat a bag of carrots, just a bag of carrots. I mean, she will be orange afterwards. She will sit down and demolish an entire bag of carrots. I just. Can't imagine that cucumbers, same thing. She she'll do that. She's to this day does not have any real um, affinity for sweets. She just does not have a um, have a real sweet tooth. Sasha, you told me um, you've told me many times, but I recall when you first told me this that you prayed for parents. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, yes, I did pray for parents. Um, we had um, Americans who came um, to share us about the gospel of Jesus. And the, the only thing is I heard that Jesus can, um, he died for on a cross and he, he hears our prayers and answers them. And I've prayed for so many years for parents and there is a lot of difficulties um, that happened and it was harder and harder as I've got older to be in an orphanage. Um, I lost a best friend and, um, it was, I've been in a hospital, um, from being beaten. So it was very, very hard. I felt like life was empty, but at the same time, I felt there was something more better to life than just wickedness or just loneliness in this life. You were in the hospital when you prayed that prayer. I did. And I actually, um, asked the Lord to take me to heaven if he's, if he's, if he is real. Or I was gonna think about committing suicide. Well, um, as you can tell, this is a, this is a tough subject and uh, it's a hard subject for us to, to cover because of the memories associated with this, but we feel like this is an important story, an important message for you to hear. Here's a little girl who had been abused and was in the hospital because her head had been pushed through a window, as I recall. A brick wall. A brick wall. And she prayed for parents. 
She prayed the Lord to give her parents. Now, she had not been taught much of the Bible. She had not been to church and Sunday school. She had not been given those things. But in and of herself, she knew there was a God, and she began praying that that God would help her. Sasha, and here you are. <laughs> it's so amazing. You have a little girl that's upstairs. You have a wonderful husband who is upstairs. You have a beautiful wife. And I want to say this. Sasha is, if you have not met Sasha and you don't know Sasha, Sasha is one of the most remarkable human beings on the planet. She is one of the most courageous human beings on the planet. <laughs> I have to tell a couple of funny stories about her. As I said, at the time that we were going through the process of adopting Sasha, she, uh, I was at that time, as I say, taking on some of the, uh, the famed atheists. Um, and Christopher Hitchens, the late Christopher Hitchens, met Sasha. And Sasha went into him like a buzzsaw, <laughs> buzzsaw to, um, to share the gospel with him. He was quite taken aback. On another occasion, I was debating atheist Michael Shermer. And uh, we're up on stage, and Michael Shermer said he did not believe in God because of suffering. Now, he admitted he had not suffered himself, but he said he didn't believe in God because of suffering. And Sasha is sitting right there in front of me. I can see her, and I can see her eyes getting big, and I'm starting to think to myself, Sasha's about to come up here and take this guy on. And do you remember what you said to him? Do you remember that? I don't. Do you remember? Uh, I remember I was very mad at him because it was his girlfriend or whatever who suffered and not him. Yeah, not him. And what's your own feeling about suffering and God? Do you... Do you? I I think I might have told him that God was with me through suffering, and I know what it's like. If if that's what, um, I, I think that's what I said. That is what. But you I said. don't remember. I was asking you if I could call, <laughs> talk to him before I get in trouble. She uh, she was still just a just a girl, and she came up there and she took him on. And you said to him, "You believed in God because of suffering." Mm hmm. Because of suffering, why do you believe in God because of suffering? Because there is no one who heard any of my prayers but only God. And um, and he has answered that moment that I prayed. Well, I prayed for a long time, but that moment where I really hardly prayed, he answered the prayer. And after my life changed so much, I believe that God brought so much goodness in my life. Yes. Well, I'm not sure if we adopted you or you adopted us. You know, the, the story was that um, uh, my wife and my three sons, I wasn't with them. They went to Ukraine as part of a mission trip to work in an orphanage. And the next thing I know, they're telling me about this little girl who keeps following them around, who keeps following them around, so that everybody began calling her Sasha Taunton, began calling her Sasha taught like, like she was a member of the family. And the next thing I know, Michael, my oldest son, and my wife, Lori, are texting me and saying, hey, what do you say we consider adopting Sasha? And so that began the lengthy process. And uh, we were going through that. And I know that process was hard for you because it was hard for you to know, is this for real? Is this really going to happen? Or is hope going to be snatched away from you? Um, it felt like some of the orphanage directors did not want you to be adopted. Was that your feeling? Yes. Why? Why, why wouldn't they want you to be adopted? Um, well, because they make money off of you if you're not being adopted. And not only that, but they So they get paid per child yes. in the orphanage. Yes. Gotcha. So they have nothing else to do. I mean, they're doing nothing and they're getting this money for free, basically. But um, they're just, they are, I just remember they scared me and not only me, but other kids to be an adopted from. And how did they try to scare you? They tried to scare you, like you don't want to be adopted, and they would tell you scary stories. What would they say? They would say that uh, Americans eat kids and sell um, each body parts of, um, and they would treat you like a slave um, when, they, when you're getting adopted. And if you will, there's no way out for you. You're stuck with them. Yeah, that's, go ahead. And I, I, of course, I didn't believe in them because I saw Michael and Zach and my mom, my family, and I knew there was so much goodness You knew we in didn't them. eat them. <laughs> yes. 
You know, um, one of the most, one of the boldest things I have ever seen in my life, one of the bravest things I've ever seen in my life. I, I in fact, braver than I, I, I just saw on Twitter a, um, an African elephant charging a guy and the man stood his ground. He didn't move and he just put his hand up and the elephant stopped. Braver than that was that the day we appeared in court, you have, to, you have to go before a judge in Ukraine and in Russia or wherever you're adopting from, and the judge rules on whether or not you can adopt the child. And we got a call the day before we were supposed to meet with the judge. And the call said, ah, tomorrow the, uh, the, the, the Ukrainian translator calls me and says, judge says she can't meet with you. I said, what do you mean she can't meet with us? This has been scheduled for six weeks or whatever it was. Yeah, something's come up. I said, but we're scheduled to fly out tomorrow. We're scheduled to, you know, we, we have this court case, we adopt Sasha, and then we're going to get on a plane and fly to America. She can't meet with you. Well, she could for $1,500. And I'm like, yep. It's par for the course. So we had to come up with another $1,500 that went to the judge. And we arrive at the courthouse and we're standing outside um, waiting to go inside. And I'm looking at this great big Mercedes and my translator comes over to me and said, that's the judge's car. You bought her that car. People like you have bought her that car. She extorts every one of you for money to buy that car. So we go into the court room for the meeting and she starts putting pressure on Sasha. Now bear in mind, Sasha's 10 years old at the time. She barely knows us. She spent time with us in our apartment a little bit, time with us over the course of you know, about two months in the orphanage when we were allowed to come and visit her there. But she doesn't really, really know us yet. And she doesn't... She doesn't speak English, so she can't really understand us. So it's mostly through signing and, you know, using gestures and, you know, like charades, you know, trying to communicate with her. And the judge says to her, I'm hearing this all through translation. She has Sasha stand up. Sasha stands up. And she says to her, you do know you're going to a country where they don't speak Russian, don't you? And Sasha says, da. She says, you do know that you won't see your friends again, don't you? Sasha says, da, yes, in, uh, in Russian. She says, you do know that you can't ever come back, da. And she keeps saying all these very leading questions, trying to get her to say she doesn't want to be adopted. And Sasha, bold as brass, she stands there, 10-year-old little girl, facing this judge all by herself. And she just says, da, 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 da. And the judge says, do you want to be adopted? And she says, da. Which was frustrating, actually. Because <laughs> I'm like, I'm ready to pack my bags and go. Yes. So. <laughs> She's like, I'm, I'm out of here. I'm ready to get out yeah. of this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was, uh, it was pretty amazing. And it was one of the most courageous things I've ever seen in my life. It would be intimidating for any adult to be standing there in front of that judge while this judge is putting this pressure on you, much less for a 10-year-old girl who's standing there all by herself while this judge, who's you know far more sophisticated because she's an adult, and is asking these very deliberately misleading questions that are meant to make the adoption sound like something you shouldn't want to do. And she's trying to get you to say no. No, I don't want to be adopted. In which case, she'd have turned to us and said, well, I'm sorry, she don't want to be adopted. She loves Ukraine. She wants to stay here in the orphanage. But you didn't do that. Do you remember that? Yes. And sadly, there's kids who've been, uh, got scared and never been adopted. And they could have had their life so much better, but they didn't. I don't think I've ever asked you this question, but... How did you find the courage to just keep saying yes? I was just excited. I, I, th I think really, like I said, I was ready to pack my bags and go <laughs> because I've, I've, I knew there was opportunity so much better for me that God has given me. And I'm not, I'm not taking that away from me. And I've, I just, 
y'all the first people when you when Zach and Chris and Michael came. Um, my and sons, ma- and our mom, sons, her brothers. My brothers. I just felt the first time really loved from being loved, and so I had no fear taking that chance. And I'm I'm really really glad that I took it. Well, I can't imagine my life if you hadn't have taken it. Um, your brothers can't imagine their lives if you hadn't have taken it. Your mother can't imagine her life if you hadn't have taken it. Dalton can't imagine her husband, my son-in-law, cannot imagine his life if you hadn't taken it. And certainly Abby Kate couldn't either. Um, what I thought was very funny was Sasha still didn't have a real concept of family. and She didn't have a concept of a home. So do you, you probably know where I'm going with this. So we yeah. arrived, we, had to, you, we flew from Kiev, Ukraine into Paris and we had a layover in Paris. And um, so we walk into an enormous, beautiful hotel that they had put us, they had put us in and we walk into this, you know, that's, that has a ceiling that's, you know, 200 feet or something, <laughs> you know, that they're, they're foyer. And Sasha walks in and she goes, Doma? Which in Russian is home. home. Like, is this your house? Like, wow, <laughs> <laughs> this is some sweet digs you got here. And I was like, no, 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 we're still not done. We still have to take another plane. We have to still go. And we had a nice time in Paris that night. I rented a, a car and we just drove to every side in Paris all at once. We went to, I we went down the Champs Elysees and we went to the Arc de Triomphe and we, we went to the Eiffel Tower. We, we went at the Louvre. We went everywhere. We just made all the rounds. And uh, your eyes were this big, you know, as you're looking out the, out the window. I'll never forget that. And then we arrive in Atlanta, Georgia. And you weren't a part of this conversation, but um, it moves me when I think about it. The uh, immigration agent that I was talking to, the, we had to hand them your papers, you know, because you were flying on a Ukrainian passport, which is like a, a third class passport. The, it's hard to get into any country with a Ukrainian passport. So when we arrive with the adoption papers, we hand those papers over to passport control and passport control goes through those papers. And according to American law, there's a lot of bad laws. This is a great one. The moment the wheels of that Boeing 747 set down in Atlanta, you became an American citizen. Just like that. And I remember the immigration agent saying to me, you were literally doing cartwheels all around in the airport. It was very funny. And the, the guy said to me, he says, does she know that her life has changed? I said, I think she does. I think, I think she does. Look at her. Look at her. <laughs> Sasha, t- tell the people who are listening the difference the gospel makes in your life. Your belief in Jesus Christ is very real for you. It's impacted your life in a, in a, in a massive way. Tell us a little bit about your faith in Jesus Christ, why you believe, and how it's changed your life. Well, I believe, of course, God answering my prayers because no one would have. And I actually once said to you and mom, I think, God has loved me first, and then y'all have loved me second. And that is completely true. It's It's hard for him to imagine now I'm adopted in your family. Now you feel like a family to me. But it's still hard. It's still hard to, um, just think that God has adopted all of us in his family before we were even. So, um, we're all chosen. We're not mistakes. Yes. And, um, it, it has changed my life, um, loving people. And, um, we, when I was in Ukraine, we felt the, when people told us you're not good enough, you're not worthy to be loved. You, there's just, and this is the people in the, who are running the orphanages who would say this to you. Yes, they would tell. tell they would tell the children, "You're not, you're not good enough. You're not worth being adopted. You're, you're not worthy. Um, your mom let you go because she just 
that you didn't want it because you didn't want it. I'm a bad person. And that was that was super hard. But when I came to United States, I've learned more about what God's love from what's his love for me. It meant to me huge how much he loves me and how much I have worth in my life. And I want kids for so many kids to share that God loves them and unconditionally and he cares about every each one of them and he will um, pay he will pay those who um, have hurt those kids yes um I think it's tomorrow night we're gonna go see the movie it is tomorrow night right I think we're gonna yes. go see that movie um cry of freedom um excuse is that the name of it the sound of freedom excuse me um, Cry Freedom is about South Africa. So Sound of Freedom, we're going to go and, uh, and see that. And as you've seen, um, CNN and other media outlets are acting like, oh, child trafficking is not a big deal. It's not a thing. This movie is an exaggeration. Now, while neither of us have seen the movie, we both know something about child trafficking. That's coming out of some of the Ukrainian orphanages, isn't it? Yes. Yes, very much. And it, it, it happens of, of like after they graduate. So because we've never been taught about the world and the only thing we know our life is in the orphanage. So there's not anything outside. Just remembering seeing, having my first, first room and walking through my Nana's house and say, who lives here? Who lives there? And it's just, it's all we knew to life. So going out of life, it's pretty scary and we don't know. So it can be pretty dangerous. Um, what she's talking about here is that the, um, the children in the orphanages are pushed out onto the street at age 16. They're given just a bit of money, as we were talking about, you know, the money that was, that was kept in a, a bank account. And if you think that getting $2,000 upon graduation is a lot of money, it isn't. I mean, it isn't going to sustain you for any length of time. And they've not been taught how to use it anyway. So they're pushed straight out onto the street. They've been taught no life skills. They don't have any friends. They don't have any contacts. Think about this. I've thought about this a lot where Sasha is concerned. Many people, ha there, there's no such thing as a self-made person. There just is no such thing. Uh, it may be that, that some people achieve more um, than others on their own um, and require less help, but we all need help. We all need advocates. And the greatest advocate for most of us is, is your family. It's, a, it's, it's your mom who believes in you and who cheers you on and who helps you through all those classes that you're taking and your, your father who, um, you know, who disciplines you and comes to your ball games and who calls up a friend and says, um, hey, you know, my son is looking for a job. You know, can he help you? Or, uh, orphans don't have those advocates. There are no advocates for them. There are no, no friends who are opening doors for them. So they're pushed out onto the street at 16. They immediately go through all that money. And then what happens is some mafia type comes along and says, ah, here's some money. And that child goes off and uh, blows it at McDonald's or whatever. And then they come back for more. But I want to go back. Yeah, go not, ahead. Not only it's outside of, the, but it's even inside of the orphanage. Okay, well, explain that. Well, there's um, adults who abuse kids sexually, um, and not only that, but uh, uh, physically too, in the orphanage. So it's and that's common. That's very common. Yes. Are, are they people who work at the orphanage? Yes. And um, so that's going on. And there are also instances of them, you know, basically renting out children to um, other parties. Uh, you, you don't have to go into it because I know it's painful, but you, you touched on your friend who you lost and uh, who was a child who disappeared from the orphanage and was found dead. Yes. And... Um, um, we speculate that there was some kind of trafficking thing involved in that instance where a child is, in some cases, we know that the orphanage is, an orphanage director, a worker in the orphanage, finds out that there's somebody out there who has some money who wants little boys, they just rent them out. You know, yeah, you can have them for a night for $200. And uh, the little friend that she's talking about um, was found dead. And uh, you were never really told why, isn't that true? No, and I've never seen um, a shot. Never seen her. Yes, child was shot. Yes, yes, and um, 
So these things go on very regularly in the orphanages. Yes, and not only that, but when actually mom, oh, my family now, when they were visiting, they locked some kids up who are going um, to say what's going on, but they locked those kids. So, and the, of course, the people who travel from America, they don't know where to look. So they're, 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 they won't. And we have to pretend that everything's okay. They treated us well. They dress us up nicely. They give you us mean good. When, when, when there's an inspection of the orphanage? Yes. Like when, when an American group is coming? Yes. And when y'all come, they dress us up. They give us cl clothes. And we have to act like everything's okay. And it's not. And if we have something to say, we are going to be punished really badly. If you say it. Yes. So an American uh, mission group comes to build a playground, let's say. All the children are cleaned up. I yes. mean, you, you got a hot shower, what was it, once a week? Once a week. It'd be every Sunday. Every Sunday. That was it. And one change of clothes. One change of clothes. So you wore those clothes throughout the week. And, um, and then when Americans come, you'd be cleaned up. Yes. And given different clothes. Yes. And then you were told you can't say anything and you had to act like everything was good. And the moment you leave, all that stuff disappears. Yes. Yeah, see, this is uh, what the Russians call a Potemkin village. This is very common. And this is what's happening with these children. And as Sasha points out, those children who, who, were, who were brave enough to try to say to those people, help us, these evil things are happening to us. They shut those kids away. Not only that, but they sometimes they even take them farther away. They'll put them on, I don't know if we got a pill or whatever. I don't know because you just woke up in a place that unknown. You are in the middle of nowhere. Did this happen to you? Yes. So they drugged you and you wake up and somewhere I, else. And I don't know where I was. I, we're not allowed. I mean, you looked outside and you didn't know where you were. Yeah. Um, That's if you were really, really bad, I guess, consider. Any of you out there who want to defend Ukraine, I, I want to drop an F-bomb on all of you because Ukraine is indefensible. There's just nothing to defend about this country. And all this stuff is still going on right now. It's just being hidden. So all the billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars that are going to from the United States over to Ukraine is just magically disappearing. If you think it's going to help children in orphanages, I promise you it is not. And I actually saw when the war began that there was this accusation that Putin was targeting orphanages, that he was bombing orphanages. Makes no sense militarily. I don't believe that that's true. But the American media kept showing all these Ukrainian orphans who all look so nice and so pretty and girls wearing dresses. And it was meant to make Americans feel like, oh, the Ukrainians, so it's horrible what's happening to these poor people. Look at how kind they are to all their orphans. And they were not, which makes me super angry because they never show the bad, evil side of what they do to us. And I, every time when my mom, we went to Moldova, I was looking for those places. And of course, they were super mad, but I had, didn't care about you, it. That's when you went um, with, uh, with Sasha and uh, my wife Lori when, um, when they went to work in orphanages in Moldova as part of a mission trip. You went there and shared your testimonial with people there. And I did. that was very inspiring to them because they understood. I did. Yeah, you were very, very powerful in doing that because the orphanage system isn't just what we're talking about. It isn't just in Ukraine. It's throughout the, the whole old Soviet Union. It's all these former uh, satellite countries that are running according to this, these old principles. Um, this, this infrastructure is still in place. It's still working. And it's atheistic to its core. They treat children like they don't have souls. They treat them like animals. In some cases, even making them eat out of dog bowls and things. That's right. That's when, that's when we went to that place. And that we, they locked us out up and gave us a dog bottle, dog bowl with food and and water. And why would they do that? To punish, I, to punish us, but we didn't deserve a thing. Not only that, but we had um, autism people who have special need autism. They even were treated way worse than you could imagine. Which so special needs children? Yes. Sasha, what do you think of American kids who think that this country is a really, really awful country? 
um, I just kind of laugh at it because I'm, I'm thinking this is the best country you could ever be. I mean, sure, we have a bunch of, you know, stuff now we have to deal with. But, we, I mean, y'all are so blessed to have family. So blessed. Even if, you know, kids are being abused here, there's, what do you call, there's people to take care of. And it's just... There's law enforcement. There's law, there's, there are agencies. There are churches. There are ways to take care of those people. Yes. But in Ukraine, there's zero. I mean, there's... I mean, there's just... Life is there is... You either survive through a horrible life or you go through it and you die. Yeah, I. some of you are going to be, uh, you're cynical and you're listening going, oh, we have problems in America too. But they're nothing, nothing like what we're talking about here. No. And they're not on the scale of what we're talking about. And let me just use a small example. If you go to the, the Department of Motor Vehicles, you stand in line to, to get your tag and you get up there and someone says to you, yeah, I'll give you your tag if you give me an extra hundred bucks. In other words, a bribe. They want to be bribed in order to give you your license plate. You would say, hold on. I want to, I want to see the manager here. You would expect that person to be punished. In Ukraine, it's the way business is done. There's no one to appeal to. In Russia, in Eastern Europe, most of the third world, most of the world lives with this kind of stuff. Most Americans don't know this, and that is because only 31% of Americans, according to, according to the data, have ever been outside of the country. And most of those have, you know, have been on a mission trip or got drunk in Tijuana, uh, a fishing trip in, in Canada. Maybe they, maybe they took a dinner cruise down the Champs-Élysées, but they don't really know what the rest of the world is like. In Ukraine, when she's talking about this kind of corruption, this kind of abuse, there's no one to appeal to because the person you're appealing to is part of the problem. They're part of the corruption. And the person above them is part of the corruption. And the person above them is part of the corruption. All the way up to, to, to Zelensky. They're all just rotten to the core. Again, we had to bribe every single government official we dealt with but one in order to make Sasha sitting here in this chair with us right now possible. And before some of you get on your high horse, and there are a few arrogant Christians who do this, and it just really ticks me off, it will say, well, gosh, Larry, you know, you're just contributing to the problem by paying that bribe. How self-righteous can you possibly be? I would have paid that bribe a million times over in order to have Sasha here because what you're basically saying in an instance like that is, I don't think her life is worth I'm going to stand on my principle of not paying a bribe and leave her in Ukraine, which makes no sense whatsoever. It makes no sense whatsoever. I love that Victor Hugo in uh, Les Miserables, Jean Valjean comes to get Cosette and he pays the bribe. He pays the bribe and you pay it uh, in order to, and by the way, I pay it because I'm a Christian, not in spite of the fact that I'm a, I'm a Christian because the life matters more. And those are people who have to answer to God. One of the things that amazes me about you, Sasha, is you don't think of yourself as a victim. You don't go through life looking to the past and, and thinking that the world owes you. No. You're a very forward-looking person. You don't want to look to the past. No. Not at all. No, because I've seen so much goodness that God has brought to me. And the fact is, you have been a victim. You were victimized by the Ukrainian government. You were victimized by Ukrainian orphanages. You were victimized by people in the orphanages. You were victimized by a lot of people. But the amazing thing to, to me about you, Sasha, it is such a gift from God. You're such a gift from God, is that you, you just shake off and just go forward. You just move forward with your life. You just say, da, 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 and you just keep going. Uh, it is an amazing thing to me because you don't want to wallow in the past and you would have every right to do it, but you don't want to go there. And in fact, doing a podcast like this is very hard for you, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, anytime I talk about uh, my story, there's always a price. Yes. And uh, I get bad dreams and all that, but I feel like it's, God has given me the story, and it's his story to share. It's not my story. It's his. And we all have a story to share. And, and God has been so good in my life. And 
and blesses me everything with <laughs> Abigail and my daughter. And I just, I just, I don't deserve those things, but God just keeps pouring uh, on you're, us. You're, uh, you're, Sasha, you're a blessing to all of us. You're a great blessing to, um, to all of us uh, because you're such an amazing human being. You know, it's, it's interesting. Um, Sasha, like any little girl, when she first um, came to the United States, became a part of her family. There are mean girls here too, aren't there? Yes. <laughs> yes, there are. And there were some mean girls at church and other places that you would encounter that did not want to, you know, who would say, well, she talks a little funny. Well, English isn't her, her first language. She learned English at the age of, of 11 as when she started learning English. And so, of course, she has an accent or who thought she was a little different. And of course, she is different. But I have always thought on that, that's God's blessing because, Sasha, you are different. And it's because you're different that you are such a blessing to so many people because you're just you're just one of the most remarkable human beings that I have ever met. And you're God's special messenger into the world to share his grace, to share his mercy, to share his gospel of salvation because you're such a powerful advocate for it because you believe it with all your heart. Yes, you do. I, uh, I know that you do. And uh, Sasha, it's interesting, Sasha has, she, she, doesn't, she doesn't have a master's degree or a PhD, but I got to tell you, she has a PhD in life. She has a PhD in um, understanding people, and she has a PhD in understanding the real value of the gospel, because you don't take it for granted, do you? You don't take salvation and God's grace, God's goodness for granted, do you? No. I mean, it's... What God has done for me, I can't. I can't turn back on him. And, and I mean, he's, he's real in this world, whether you see him or not. So now you're a mother, and I haven't asked you this question privately yet. So I'll ask it right here. What do you want for your daughter that you didn't have? I want you to know, I want for her to be loved like I was not be loved by my mother. And I want her to have value in herself. Um, and I want her to know who has made her and what her life is ahead, to whom she should give praise and, um, and, who, and what matters in life and what doesn't. It is such a joy for me, Sasha, as your father. And I know the same is true for uh, Lori, your mother, and for your brothers, uh, one of whom is sitting off camera over here, to watch you flourish as a mother. It's been so much fun to watch. It's been fun with all of our children um, that are parents. You know, Michael, Michael has um, two little girls, and um, Christopher and Zachary need to get on that. And, uh, <laughs> and I need some grandsons, by the way. Just putting that out Hurry there. Hurry up, Zach. Just putting that out there. But uh, it's such a joy for us to watch them now parents. And it's been fun this week watching you and Dalton parents, your good parents, the things you say you want for Abby Kate, she's getting. She's getting. It's, she is the happiest little baby. She uh, is, knows she's loved. Um, she will have no doubt that Jesus Christ is her Savior. I'm confident of that. She'll have no doubt that her mama and daddy love her very much. I am sure she's going to hear the gospel again and again from her mother's mouth. She's going to hear that. She's going to hear that a lot. And I know that you will raise her in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I know you will. You're already a great mother. And it is, it is my joy to hold little Abby Kate until she poops her diaper and, uh, or cries, and then I just hand her right back um, to you. That is my prerogative to do that, and it's fun for me to, um, to watch you have to deal with some of those things now. But in my mind, Sasha, the incredible thing, because you are my child, and I can't ever think of you as not my child. <laughs> so it's the funny thing. It's, it's, it's a beautiful thing, actually, about adoption. Because if you believe in Jesus Christ, we've all been adopted. 
just as you said. All of us who believe in Jesus Christ, we have been adopted by our Heavenly Father. So he gave us a model that adoption is a beautiful thing. It's not a secondary thing. It's not like, you know, there are biological children and then the adopted ones aren't. No, no, no. The, if you've been adopted, you've been chosen. That's the beautiful thing. You were selected. You weren't an accident. We chose you. I was chosen by God the Father. You were chosen by God the Father. These guys were chosen by God the Father. How cool is that? And um, I just love that. And now here we are all these years later, and now you're a mother. And that just blows my mind. I just, I, I have to, I, I still see you. This will sound, this will sound very um, cliche, but to me, you're still just my little girl. You're still just my little girl. But now you're my little girl with a little girl. <laughs> and that's so, that's so cool. So as you look around, Sasha, you know, as we finish this, this interview and this podcast, what advice would you have for Americans who are about your age, who think that America, that they think their life is rough and they think that America is a, a really tough and awful place and that America should be like some other country in the world? What would you say to them? I would just, I would just, I would just share my story and tell them, imagine you have none of those things. America has so many great opportunities. And even when you were adopted me, it was so special to have family who cares and love me. And who, not only that, I hated spankings. But <laughs> in the end, I just knew how much my parents loved me, you know, yeah. by doing that. It shows love. Nobody ever did that for me, ever. Well, you're right. I mean, they're, they don't know any better, and so they think that life is hard. And it doesn't mean there aren't any real challenges or there aren't any real victims. There, there are in this country as, as well as others. But you, you have so much in this country, and Americans are going to lose it if they burn it to the ground because they think, they've been led to believe that there's an alternative that is better. And as a guy who's been in a, a gazillion countries, I can tell you that there aren't that there aren't, and, uh, and that's problematic. And your life changed the moment those wheels touched down in Atlanta. Your life changed, and you've had so many opportunities in this country, as I have had, as, uh, as the, the rest of our children have had, and, uh, and we hope to preserve that um, for you and for your children, for Abby, and for any other children, which I should expect will be coming before too long, some little boys, and uh, <laughs> see what uh, see what happens there. But those are the wonderful things that that the Lord has given us, and it's um, um, you know the psalmist wrote, "Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord." And we become increasingly barbaric in this country, killing our unborn and the things that are happening with the sexualization of children in this country. We become increasingly barbaric in that manner and in others as we drive God out mm -hmm. of, of um, public life and out of our personal lives. So in closing, what would be the last thing you would want to say to the people who are listening? I would want them to travel and see places and not just read about them, but actually see those places and be praying for those who travel and for praying for the kids who are going through, um, who are going through difficult times and um, pray for them. And the real trafficking that is taking place that is very real, that is coming out of the orphanages as Sasha mentioned. Sasha, it's been very special for me to have you as my very first guest on Ideas Have Consequences. You've been a great guest. Um, Dr. Lennox will be on at some point as a guest, and I must tell you, he has a difficult act to follow in coming after you, so. Well, I feel very honored, and thank you for having me. <laughs> this has been Ideas Have Consequences. Thank you for watching. <laughs>